The Word of God is alive and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we always say that the spiritual spin stuff right here. Why? Because I really care for you. We're going to take just a, uh, a few minutes to, uh, to pray, if necessary. And that is to confess known sins. If you have any known sins that you have not confessed since the last time you had a time of confession, this is the time to do it. For confession of sins clears the deck so that you can function in Operation Cry, no reckon, reckon, and yield. And when you've yielded to the Spirit of God, you're prepared to study the Word of God where the Spirit of God can teach you, bear witness, and, and in fact, lead you. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out our prayer time and pick up our study in just a moment. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of studying your word once again. Every day, every day is a day that we, we have an opportunity to study the Word of God. And I would pray that uh, those who are uh, calling themselves Christians across this country will give diligence to the study of the Word of God. Read it for yourself, but make certain that you have a pastor teacher who can explain the Word of God to you. Father, I thank God for every person that's logged on, whether it's by way of recording, whether it's live on Facebook, YouTube, or even on WebEx. Actually, it's recorded on YouTube, Father. But I, I just thank you for the, for the privilege of being able to disseminate the Word of God. As I understand it as a pastor and teacher after all these years of continue, continue, continue study, I'm still open to the teaching of the Word of God, Father, so in those areas where I still lack, I would pray, Father, that you would guide me into the truth in Christ's name. Amen. We talked about the phone. Okay. Uh, okay, I just shut down your microphone, Troy. That's okay. You had your microphone on, and I've just shut it down. And uh, so just uh, stay uh, tight right like you are. Now, look here. Uh, I want to make, a, make mention of the fact that uh, Daryl is not on with me yet. Uh, I don't know whether he's on Facebook or not, but he was going to log on tonight if he was able to. And I want you to know that last night, Daryl had a, a problem with Facebook, uh, just uh, the same kind of thing that I've had in the past. He logged on, was getting ready to teach, and lo, the number of people that normally log on with him on Facebook, he wasn't able to get out there. So he paused for a few minutes, called WebEx, and uh, over a brief period of time, they got it up and working again, but he felt like it was too late to continue. So he, was, uh, he, was, he and I talked about this, and he is planning a two-week vacation, and he will be leaving, uh, he thought he was leaving tomorrow, and so he was going to try to stream live from his hotel room in, in San Diego tomorrow night. But he discovered that he's not leaving, uh, not leaving uh, Fargo, North Dakota, until Friday. So he, what he's going to do is tomorrow night he's actually going to stream from his hotel room in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, before he gets on the airplane the next day to go to San Diego. And uh, so I just want to make you aware of the fact that Daryl will be streaming live tomorrow night. And due to due to the fact of his uh, his lesson. He's got a PowerPoint presentation that I believe is going to cover the 20 years of ministry in the Philippines, and he'll be talking about the men, the women uh, that uh, we have had in our ministries over there for a number of years. He's going to feature the pastor teachers who are actually teaching the Word of God. He's going to give you information about these guys and what a magnificent job they are doing in taking the Word of God 
out to the recesses of um, of Mindanao into areas where perhaps I've I've never been there uh, into some of these areas. But he's go, Daryl's going to uh, to feature these men, and I see our brother uh, Roger Lamuco is on with us tonight. And uh, God bless you, Roger. I, I love you and love your uh, your family, my, my daughter-in-law. I love the Philippines, Mindanao, Davao City, and all around that area. What fond memories I have of that. And I, I thank Sir Darrell for uh, picking up the mantle and continuing on. So I would encourage all of you, set your, set your clock, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, to be on with, uh, with Sir Darrell. And he may not have your address, but just mark it down, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, and, uh, uh, and log on with him, okay? That will be on, on Facebook. Now, with that in mind, let's move on from here. And what we're going to do is we're going to study tonight Acts chapter 13, verses 22 through 39. And I want to call your attention again to the, to the problems that we have in the United States of America. Now, here's the issue. This is not just another nice Bible study. So if I were to go down the list and just call out the names of those who are on with me on, on WebEx, and then just take a look at those who may be online with us on Facebook. What I would like to do is simply say to you, uh, we have a responsibility as royal priests. Oh, yes, we do. And royal ambassadors. As a royal ambassador, we represent God before our fellow man. And that means that when you're out in the public square, we have the, we have the responsibility to be witnesses to those people that we come in contact uh, contact with. Now, that doesn't mean you reach up and grab them by the shoulder and say, hey, you know, i got to tell you about Jesus. No, God will provide the opportunities for you to do that, and I would encourage you to, in fact, uh, um, notice, note, take note of those opportunities. I was out yesterday in, uh, uh, I was at Panera Bread, and I was there because we had some things that Janet and Leanne were doing. And so I went to Panera Bread with my computer, and I was studying there. And along came a gentleman, an elderly gentleman, and he said to me, um, Sir, he said, you can plug your computer in right down there. And he was actually gracious enough to show me where I could plug my computer in. The only problem was I knew that I wasn't going to need the electricity because my my computer was powered up. But in the course of the conversation, I said, to him, I said to that gentleman, I said, you know, you've been very kind to me every time I've been in here. He works at Panera Bread, and he cleans tables and that kind of thing. And I said, you've been very, very helpful to me in the past. And I said, I want to tell you how much I really appreciate you and what you do. And he said, well, thank you very much. And I looked at him and I said, sir, are you a born-again Christian? And he said, oh, my, yes. Oh, yes. I said, do you know whether or not you would go to heaven if you died right now? He said, oh, yes, I would. And I said, well, thank God. I, God bless you, sir. And they turned around and he walked away. And I, what my point is this. There, all you have to do is be aware of the opportunities. Every meeting, every person you meet is an opportunity. So we have to learn how to address this and just not yank them up and say, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. No, there's, there's thousands of ways of doing this. I just want you to be aware of that. Now, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to continue in chapter 13, verses 22 through 39. And what we're going to see is the Apostle Paul and his boldness, his courage for speaking directly to a group of Jewish people in the synagogue, basically, religious, unbelieving Jews, and he's going to be addressing them, and he's, he's in the process of giving them a long uh, history, uh, a history that he's recounting to them, and he's going to be pointing out in most of these um, historic periods how apostate Israel was at that point in time. That is the time of his historical narrative. And he's going to lead up to telling them, uh-huh, and in fact, you know, your generation's the same. And I want to give you a message. And he gives them the gospel of Christ. Now look here. Let's begin then 
in Acts 13, verses, um, verse 9, really, and I have done this before, but I want to show you something. I want to show you where we have been, where we're, where we're going. In verse 9 of Acts 13, we find the first recorded sermon of Paul. Now, that's not his first sermon. It's the first recorded sermon of Paul. And this entire chapter from verse 9 down, following, going down, we're going to see that Paul is giving them that history lesson. In verse 10, Saul, Paul actually scolds uh, the magician Bar-Jesus. And Bar-Jesus, son of Joshua, this is a man who is an unbeliever who is demon-influenced. Now, in verse 11, Paul narrates for him the consequences of being demon-influenced. Then in first, and then, listen, this, this courage, this, Paul's right in his face giving him this information. Now, he's doing it with respect. He called him Bar-Jesus, which is son of Joshua. And then in verse 12, he speaks to Sergius Paulus, and he, he's going to become a believer. Sergius Paulus is, in fact, the governor in that area, and Bar-Jesus, the demon-influenced man, is actually the advisor of this unbelieving Sergius Paulus. In verse 13, Paul and Barnabas then and John Mark travel to Perga. That is, uh, they're, they're, done in, they're done down in, uh, in uh, Cyprus, and they now travel by boat about 100 miles uh, up to the shore and then go on into Perga by way of the seaport Atalia. And, and when, they, when they arrive, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, when they arrive then in Perga, John departs. We'll talk later about why he departs, and we'll see that later. But John departs, and he goes back to Jerusalem. Now, this is the John that wrote the Gospel of Mark. In verse 14, we saw Paul and Barnabas enter the synagogue in Antioch, Pisidia. So that once they got to Perga, then they moved on to they moved on to Antioch, Pisidia, not Antioch, not, not Antioch, Syria. That's where we found Peter and uh, many others earlier in in the Book of Acts. But now Paul and Barnabas are actually up in Antioch, Pisidia. And we find in verses 15 through 21, uh-oh, Paul is going to start his history lesson to the Jews, the, the, uh, the religious Jews, unbelieving type, in the synagogue. So they went into the synagogue, and Paul gives apostate Jews in that synagogue. See, they're apostate. Why are they apostate? They have not believed that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. So in, he gives them a a lengthy history lesson. Now, what they what they said in this right in this area of scripture, they had just finished reading the script, reading the, the, the law and uh, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, and the leader stands up and says, "Now, if anyone has anything that they would like to say, if you would like to uh, to give an exhortation." stand up and do so. Oh boy, that gave Paul an opportunity. So he didn't miss it, so he stood up. And this is where the history lesson began. So we find, first of all, right here, he, began, he went all the way back to Egypt and talked about the descendants of, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being apostate, and God takes them into down into, uh, into Egypt for 430 years. They pled to God, pled to God, pled to God, pled to God, get us out of here. Well, 430 years later, God delivers them by way of Moses, and Moses leads them into the wilderness, and every one of those nearly 2 million Jews who came out of Egypt... Yes, every one of them were born again. Every adult believer was born again. A born again believer, not Christian, but a born again Jew. They were Messianic Jews. They had accepted Christ as the Messiah. So God leads them into the wilderness, and lo, too much water to Red Sea, bitter water here, uh, not enough water somewhere else. So they just complained and complained and complained, and God wants to lead them into the promised land, oh, into the promised land, but they bellyache for 40 years. And every, 
every person, every Jew in the wilderness, 20 years of age and older, died in the wilderness because they were apostate and there were just a few who went into, the, uh, went into, into Canaan. Now, we find then that God distributes, once they're in the, in the area of Canaan, then what God does is to those, the remnant, the believing Jews, God distributes the land as an inheritance, and it, that dividing the land takes place over 450 years. Then we find we enter into the period after the, after the land is distributed. We've got a period where God gave them judges. Why? Because the people couldn't take care of themselves, so God gave them judges. And that took place over a 365-year period up until Samuel the prophet. Then we find Israel, what do they do? They ask God for a king. So God gives them a king. Now I want you I want you to see something here because I'm going to go to another I'm going to go to another document and the question here is if God gave uh, Israel a king and he gave them Saul a question has arisen in the past as to how long was Saul the uh, the king over Israel. I'm going to tell you that the best information that I have is possibly 12 years. Now, what I don't want to do is I don't want to take the time to establish with credibility this 12 years. In other words, I don't want to have to verify that for you right now. Please, just hang in there with me. I will do that at a later date. But I do want you to, I do want you to see something because if you are relying on Scripture to find out just how long Saul was the king over, over Israel, Here's what, here's what you're likely to see. I'm going to take you to, uh, to, a path, uh, to a, another document, and I want you to, to see with me. This, this document was written by a man uh, by, uh, whose name was Claude Mariotini, and he's a professor of Old Testament in Northern Baptist Seminary. Now, just extracting some information from his, his article um, began with a statement that Saul actually reigned only two years in Israel. The statement, now listen to me, the statement that Saul reigned only two years in Israel finds no support in the biblical text. Now what we need to realize is that it is true that a proper regnal formula, now what is a proper regnal, now just a second. Okay, a proper regnal formula is, pro, is pro, the provision of a list of kings, regnal, a list of kings, giving you the, uh, the name of the king um, and how long, how long they reigned, when they started, and when they ended their reign. So to, in order to get a proper regnal tr formula, we're going to have to realize that as far as Saul is concerned, there is, a, there is something missing in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. The reason for this, now listen, the reason for the miss, something missing in the formula in 1 Samuel 13, 1, is because the numbers, how many, how many, when did he start? How old was he when he started? How old was he when he, when he went off the scene? How long was he, how long was he king? The reason for this Misunderstanding is because the numbers in the Hebrew text of First Samuel chapter thirteen verse one, the miss, the numbers are missing. So that, for example, the the New Revised Standard Version recognizes the problem of the missing numbers by leaving blank spaces. This is how the New Ver, New Revised Standard Version is translated. Now, please do this. Don't do this to me. Don't say, well, you know, I've heard about the Revised Standard. I've heard about the NAS. I've heard about some, uh, excuse me, just hang in there with me, please. This is how the New Revised Standard Version translates 1 Samuel 13, 1. Saul was dot, dot, dot. In other words, there's a blank there. Saul was blank years old when he began to reign. And he reigned blank and two years over Israel. So the question is, is there a one there right here? Is there, should there be a one right there? He reigned one year, one and 12 years, one and 12 be 12 years. 
two and twelve would be twenty. Uh, two, two and two, two years would be two and twenty years. Uh, then uh, three and three and two years, thirty-two. So the idea is in the new Revised Standard Version, there is a blank space there because the numbers aren't in the Hebrew text. Over the years, then, biblical translators have made several attempts at guessing how old Saul was when he became king of Israel and how long his reign lasted. Here are a few examples. The New International Version translates 1 Samuel 13.1 as follows. Saul was 30 years old when he became king. This is not Saul of Tarsus now. This is King Saul. Saul was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. The Holman Christian Standard Bible translates the same, same, ver same verse. <coughs> Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 42 years, basically the same as the New International. The New English translation translates as follows. Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned over Israel 40 years. Now we got 40 here, and 42 in the other in the other two verses. Now the new American the new American Standard Bible actually translates as follows: Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 32 years. Well, we got 42 up here, and now we got 32 down here. The New English Bible translates as follows: Saul was 50 years old, not 40. He was 50 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 22 years. The TNK translates as follows. Saul was blank years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel two years. The Modern Reader's Bible, a translation done by Richard G. Moulton, translates as follows. Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. The Do A. Reams Bible, 1899 American edition, translates as follows. Saul was a child one year. Ooh, listen to me. Saul was a child one year. And when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. So he's one year old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years. The American Standard Version translates as follows. Saul was 42 years, or 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. Now the King James Version translates it this way. Oh, look at this one. The King James Version translates it translates in this way. Saul reigned one year. Now watch this. Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel. Now, in that entry, he reigned one year. And when he reigned two years over Israel. In the New Testament, Acts 13.21 says, Saul reigned 40 years. Now, when you see all those different versions, translations, these translations reveal Several factors. One, no one knows how old Saul was when he began to reign in Israel because the text does not give his age when he ascended to the throne. Although, point two, although the text does not say how long Saul reigned, the total years of his reign was a number that ended in two since the number missing in the, in the Hebrew text ends in two. Third, the idea that Saul reigned the reign la his reign lasted 40 years, is based on harmonization of the 40 years mentioned in Acts 13.21 with the number 2 that appears at the end of 1 first, uh, first Samuel 13, verse 1. Now, what am I doing here? I simply wanted to say, if you're talking about how long Saul reigned, we don't know. And there's, uh, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there, there is a means of... Um, of um, getting a result that seems as though that it was possibly 12 years. But at this point in time, I'm not going to follow that. I just wanted to see, show you what the Scripture says in many verses and why there's a, a controversy regarding how long he actually reigned. Let's pick up a verse 22 now. We've, we've studied up through verse 21. Let's pick up a verse 22. After he had removed him, he, he, raised up, he raised up David to be their king. In other words, we've, we've come down through this process uh, in verse 15 through 21 where we're getting this his, history of Israel. So it says, and, and he had removed him. That's King Saul. He raised up David to be their king concerning whom he had testified and said, 
I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all, who will do all my will. Well, let's sort of take a look at this and see maybe if, if we're understanding this correctly. He says, after he, he is God. God actually moved King Saul from his kingship, from his reign. And he, God, God raised up David to be Israel's king. So Saul's gone. We don't know how long he reigned. Don't know what, how old he was when he started. But Saul was, Saul was a king. They asked for him. God gave him, gave him a king. And actually, he did not do well while he was a king. Therefore, God got rid of him and raised up David. So he, he raised up David to be their king. Concerning David, God also testified. So when he raised up David, here's what he said. He said, I, God, I have found David, the son of Jesse, and this David is a man after my heart. David will do all my will. Now I want you to note something here. Beginning with verse 30, uh, verse 22, we've got all these apostates, these historical narratives where apostasy was very real. You'd have a remnant, they go astray, God would have to discipline. They'd, they'd uh, raise up others, they'd go okay for a while and become apostate, and he'd have, to, he'd have to deal with them. Well, beginning verse 22, Luke is now in the heart of his message, this entire historical narrative. He's now at the heart of his message. He's talked about the apostasy, 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 apostasy. Now guess what? He's going to look at David and from David on, he's going to give us a narrative where God is providing the answer for Israel one more time. So Luke is now in the heart of his message to his audience in the synagogue. Notice he is again in the synagogue, and he is in Antioch, Pisidia. And, and Paul then announces, according to God's promise, that God raised up David's, listen, God raised up David's seed, a savior for Israel. So through this David, in the historical narrative, bring, bring David in, a man after God's own heart, and he, uh, so, uh, Paul is going to show that through David's seed, through his genealogy, he's going to provide a savior for Israel. This is the savior that these people in this synagogue have missed for years. To make this type of statement and I just have to say it, to make this type of statement in an environment that is typically hostile to Jesus as the Messiah, what is it? I believe that it is, in fact, a statement, a, a, a statement of courage, an example of courage. And it's an example of courage to whom? To every born-again Christian. So it doesn't make a difference where you live. Are you living in Little Rock? Are you living in Momel? Are you in Greenbrier? Are you uh, somewhere? Are you in Davao City, Mindanao? Are you in Antioch, Arkansas? Are you are you in uh, are you in a uh, Hot Springs Village, Arkansas? Are you in California? Where are you? As born again Christians, we have a responsibility to present Jesus Christ as Savior to those with whom we come in contact. That is out there in the public square. And you need to realize that when you do this, there are going to be times when, in fact, you will need the same kind of courage that's being demonstrated by, by Paul and Barnabas in this synagogue outside of, outside of Jerusalem, yes, but he's presenting this, and he, he is aware of all of the uh, persecution that men like himself, men like him, Barnabas, have gone through, yet, lo, what's he do? He stands up in the synagogue and courageously presents Jesus Christ as the, as the Messiah. Now, when he does this, he's not being hostile. He's not being antagonistic. He's... He's simply presenting a message that these people need to hear. Now, in verse 23, he continues the narrative about Jesus, the Messiah. So he says, from the descendants of this man, he's talking about David, 
from the descendants of this man according to promise. Wow. From the descendants of this man according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. These people don't believe this, folks. They do not believe it up to this point in time. So Paul is actually saying here, as we exposit this, from the descendants of this man, David. So what he's going to do, he's going to give them a genealogy. And he's going to say, starting with David, and he, David, is, David is the father of this one, who's the father of this one, who's the father of this one, all the way down to Jesus. So he's telling them, from the descendants of this man, David, according to God's promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. This verse tells us, these people in this synagogue, if they were aware of their own scripture, what are they doing? The, gee, they're, they're, they're reading the scripture in the synagogue. They're talking about the scripture in the synagogue. Every Sabbath day they do the same thing. They, they, read, the, they read the scripture in the Old Testament. They read the Mosaic Law. Then they discuss it. Much like, much like born again Christians going to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, going on Sunday and Monday and Wednesday and whatever, however many days a week they go. And yet when they come out, they heard it, and guess what? They walk in, they sit down, they listen. They get up, they walk out, they go out into the world, and what they heard has absolutely no effect on them out in the public arena. In fact, I'm not going to open my mouth because I realize that I may stir up a stew of some sort. Well, hello. So here it is. David, uh, Paul is telling these people in the, in the synagogue you take a look at this man, David. Listen, you read the Psalms. You understand all this. But do you realize that this Jesus, the Son of God, <coughs> the Messiah of Israel, he is a descendant of, of, um, of David, and he comes to you, Israel, as your Savior, according to a promise that has come from God the Father. Now, I notice I have something in here. I said, according to God's promise. And you see, I've got that superscript one there. According to God's promise. Well, Jesus is the seed of David. That means when you take a look at the genealogy of David, you start with David, and you keep going one generation after another, and you end up with Jesus. Jesus is the seed of David, and Paul uses this expression to show the relationship between the Davidic covenant and its fulfillment in the person of the Lord Jesus. Now, you see what happens is the, the Jews know what the Davidic covenant is. They know what, they know what the unconditional covenant, uh, the, the conditional covenant with, uh, with Israel is. God had a conditional covenant. The Mosaic, it's the Mosaic law. God said, if you will do this, I will do that. But there were four unconditional covenants. See, the mosaic, uh, the mosaic law was conditional. If you do this, I'll do that. But the, the four unconditional covenants were the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant that promised them land, the Davidic covenant, we'll talk about that in a minute, and the new covenant with Israel that will be undertaken and established in the millennium. But what is David do, what is Paul doing here? He's taking this man David, a man after God's own heart, and they would believe that. But wait a minute, from that David came a person many generations later who is the promise that God made to Israel regarding a certain thing. And what was that? Jesus is the seed of David, and Paul uses this expression According to God, according to, to the promise, he used this to show the relationship between the Davidic covenant. Yes, you know about the Davidic covenant, but guess what? 
When you understand that divinity covenant, that is attached to this guy out here I'm trying to tell you about. Jesus the Messiah. So Paul uses this expression to show the relationship between the divinity covenant and its fulfillment, the fulfillment of the, of the divinity covenant in the Lord Jesus. Here's the issue. God had promised Israel that that someone, someone would be seated eternally on the throne of David. So that when David goes off the scene, his throne is not going to, it's not going to end. But God has someone who will sit on that throne for all of eternity. So from the time of the, the, writer, the writing of the Psalms, down to this point in time, uh, nobody around David's throne. I guess it's gone. And Paul said, oh, no, 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 no. God, God is fulfilling his promise in this man right here that I'm presenting to you that you crucified back in Jerusalem. That man is going to sit on that throne forever. Well, what is the Davidic covenant? The Davidic covenant, among other things, defines the ruling family. The ruling family, a throne, the eternal authority of the nation of Israel under the rule of Christ. It's God's family, and Jesus will sit on that throne throughout all of eternity, and he's going to start to sit on it at the second advent. So let's look at a couple, of passage, uh, a couple more passages of Scripture. For example, David is writing, and he's talking about the Davidic covenant the covenant that God established with Israel early on in their history. And in Psalm 89, 28, and 29 says, God says, my loving kindness I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall be confirmed to him. My covenant shall be confirmed to him. Listen, verse 29. So I will establish his descendants forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So God is going to establish his descendants forever. In other words, there will, there will be Jews throughout eternity. God, is, God has established that. He's going to establish his descendants, David's descendants forever, and he's going to establish his throne, David's throne, how long? As the days of heaven. That's the, that is the Davidic covenant. It's a promise. And it is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, whom these people crucified. Well, if he's going to sit on the throne, I guess he's going to have to come back, isn't he? See, that's the idea. 2 Samuel 7, 13 and 16. Not 13 through 16. 13 and 16. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name. Jesus will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne. There it is. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16. Your house and your kingdom, Israel, shall endure before me how long? Forever. Your throne. Your throne shall be established forever. Your, your house, Christ, Jesus, your kingdom, Christ, shall endure before me, God, how long? Forever. And your throne, Jesus, shall be established forever. See, that's the Davidic covenant. You and I as Gentiles, I say that. well, Gentiles, we're now Christians, but we come from a Gentile background, most all of us, I guess. And we have a little, little knowledge of the, the Old Testament, a little, law, little, little knowledge of the law. Well, what do you mean a an Abrahamic covenant? What do you mean a Palestinian covenant? What do you mean a Davidic covenant? What do you mean a new covenant? I don't understand all that stuff they say. Well, these people understood it. So Paul is pointing out very clearly that those apostate Jews down through the history, as I'm giving you this historical narrative, as Paul is speaking to the, to the synagogue, you've missed it here. This man, Jesus, who's the seed of David, is going to sit on that throne forever, and it's the, it's the person that you actually crucified. 
Now, notice here again, he talks about the descendants, the descendants of, uh, of David. Well, here's what they are. If you started, and we're going to read, we're going to read this list down. We're going to go down, down the down the list, and just just for the fun of it, I don't know if that's the right word or not. But when he talks about the descendants of David from David and his progeny, you start out with David, and he's going to be at the end of the line. So what I'm going to do is start out with Jesus and go backwards. And each one of these, as we go down this list is the son of, is the son of, is the son of. Jesus, for example, in Luke we get the lineage of uh, lineage of Jesus all the way back to David. And we, when you get when you go to uh, Matthew, you're going to get it all the way back to uh, to Adam. So Luke's genealogy says like this Jesus, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, uh, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, second column, the son of Hezli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matthias, the son of Simeon, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malia, the third column, the son, son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mena, the son of Mephata, the son of Nabon, the son of David, and the son of David, there it is, who is the son of Jesse. We have just seen. Now, if you go here from the son of Jesse and you go up the line, come to the second column and go up the line, come to the first column, go up the line, you get to Jesus again. This, uh, these are the descendants of, of uh, David that he's talking about here. Now, in verse 24, actually, we were in verse 23 up here, verse 23 right here. Now we move on to verse 24. In verse 24, Paul now tells of John the Baptist's introduction of Jesus to Israel. So we've, we've just moved from David, and through his genealogy, we have, uh, we have pushed the narrative all the way down historically to John the Baptist. And Paul is chronicling all this in that, uh, in that synagogue. And isn't it interesting <clears throat> that when... when uh, when Paul and Barnabas went into the synagogue, they sat down, and the 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 Mosaic law, the law was being uh, being read. When they had finished that, that portion of their service, the leadership stands up and said, "Okay, now if anyone would like to give an exhortation, please stand up." They were not ready for this. I don't know how long it took Paul to do this, but you can see that when he's chronicling all this down to the point of John the Baptist, this would have taken some time, and these people are sitting there listening to the history of Israel, looking at the apostasy, what God had done for that, and Paul is leading up to something. So he gets to John the Baptist in verse 24, and he introduces John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is going to introduce Jesus to Israel. And John testifies, uh-oh, John testifies to Israel that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Now, I have a note here. While Jesus is the descendant of David, please recognize from verse 16 up above, that, was in, in, uh, that would have been in Monday night's uh, lesson, please recognize from verse 16 of this chapter that John is actually addressing, uh, at the, uh, when he's doing his baptizing, he is addressing his mes message primarily to the descendants of Abraham, meaning Jews. However, John includes in his message everyone who fears God, and these would be Gentile proselytes. That back up in verse 16. Now in verse 24, we're all the way down in the historical narrative to John the Baptist. And it says, after John had proclaimed before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now let's look at that again, because I've got a, I've got a, um, a couple super, superscript numbers here 
1 and a 2. After John the Baptist had announced, had announced before the coming of Jesus, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now here's the issue. This says that before Jesus came, John the Baptist is out here announcing a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So the idea here is Jesus is about to Jesus is born. John is out there. Uh, John is out there preaching. Jesus hasn't become public just yet, but knowing that this is going to happen, John is out there proclaiming that Jesus is going to be coming, and as a result of that, you need to get ready, Israel. So I'm proclaiming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now, this is not in my notes. It has nothing to do with this, but the thought just came to me that right now, oh, Jesus is coming back a second time, but before that, he's coming back at the rapture. So when he comes back at the time of the rapture, I would hope that you out there, whether you're on WebEx, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're going to be out there on YouTube, or any other way you get this message, when it is shared by somebody else on their timeline, <clears throat> I would hope that you would hear this message because God has a message for you also, just as John was proclaiming the coming of Jesus, that is, his ministry is about to begin, and you need to know who this Messiah is. He is the Messiah. He's about to start that ministry, and you need to get ready. You need to be prepared to receive him when he comes. So in verse 24, that superscript one, and John had proclaimed. What does that mean? It says that John had proclaimed means John is announcing. He is announcing when he's announcing before. John is announcing beforehand. What that means is that John is actually a herald announcing the coming of the king, that is Jesus. He's 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 born. He's alive and doing well, but he hasn't set out on his ministry just yet. So John is proclaiming as a herald, he's announcing the coming of the king, that would be Jesus, and John made the announcement before the Lord Jesus actually appeared on the scene. Now notice, after John had proclaimed before the coming of Christ, he was announcing a baptism of repentance. And what is a baptism of repentance? The baptism of repentance is literally a baptism, water baptism. John was immersing these people. He was, he was uh, announcing uh, this baptism of repentance, which is characterized, it's a baptism characterized by repentance. In other words, when you undergo this, what you're doing is you're characterizing this as the fact that I have just repented. So, a baptism or repentance here is characterized by repentance, and it refers to a change of mental attitude. What is the change of mental attitude? That is, those people who are going to be baptized are people who have already changed their mind and believe now that Jesus is the Messiah. Prior to this time, what were they doing? Just like all the other Jews at that point in time, they were going to synagogue. They were going through the motions of the law, that obedient to the law. But they failed to see that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, let me point out something here. If, in fact, you happen to have logged on with me tonight, and you are a you are a Jew, you are a uh, you are you have the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not demeaning you. I'm not indicating here a racist attitude. I'm simply giving you, in, in, uh, with agape love, a love that allows you to make your own decisions one way or another, and I'm clear out of the way. I'm simply a mouthpiece for God, the Father, and I'm doing what he wants me to do, and that is simply announcing that, hey, just like Back at this point in time, the Jews at that point in time were apostate. They had not recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He hadn't, he hadn't necessarily, let them back up, prior to the time that he was born, 
they could still have been saved by believing in the Messiah to come. They had evidence throughout the entire Old Testament, the sacrifices and the rituals and everything else, pointing to Jesus Christ who was coming. They should have seen him. They could believe back there. There were believers. David was a believer. Jesus hadn't come on the scene yet. But he believed the right thing. He believed the truth about Jesus the Messiah that was coming. And guess what? He was a born-again believer. Now what happens is this baptism of repentance then that John is preaching is a baptism characterized by repentance. And I have a word of caution here. John didn't baptize just anyone who showed up. John baptized only those Jews who had changed their attitude toward Christ. And the attitude of, toward Christ was that he was and he is the Messiah of Israel. That's verse 24. Now, in verse 25, John says that he is not Jesus. I wonder why he would say that. Verse 25 said, And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, the one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to undie. Well, let's take a look at that for a minute. John says, and while, the scripture says, and while John was completing his course, now, this is the same, same idea of Paul talking about running the course. The, the idea here is a race. When you enter a race, you don't enter a race to go the first 100 feet. You don't enter a race to, if you're at, let, let's just say you're in, a, uh, in a, uh, a, a race for a mile, okay? It's a, a mile race. You don't enter the race and stop at the end of the the first uh, the first quarter mile. No, you don't stop at, at, at a half mile. You don't go three quarters of a mile. You don't go seven eighths of a mile. You don't go fifteen sixteenths of a mile. You go the entire mile. You finish the race. That's what we have. While John was completing his course, we'll talk about that again in a minute. And that word course means race. Well, John was finishing his work. It's the work that God had for him to do. He's up there baptizing people, calling people to repentance because Jesus, the Messiah, is just about to make a public, uh, make a public appearance as the Messiah. Says, so John kept saying, John kept saying, John kept saying, what do you do? What do you do? Suppose that I am. I'm not he. Behold, the one is coming. A reference to Jesus coming after me. The sandals of whose, whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Well, take a look at this superscript one. I am not he. What's John mean by that? John was the subject of much discussion during his time. John was the subject of much discussion because he, John, John the Baptist, was famous in his own day. And what was he doing? He was constantly emphasizing the fact that he was not the Messiah. John's ministry was so great that many people at that point in time thought he was the fulfillment of the Messianic passages. See, there were groups of people that said, oh yeah, boy, there's, there's something back here in the scripture that says, oh, look at all these passages down here that are telling us that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. They knew what those were. And because of that, oh boy, they thought John was the Messiah. So John says, uh-uh, no, uh, what, do you th what do you suppose I am? I'm not the Messiah. But behold, he's coming, and he's coming after me. In other words, after I finish my work, here he is. Now in verse 26, the main body of Paul's message. So we've seen him, we've seen him get to, to David, all that history. He gets down to David, a man after his own heart. And from David, he comes all the way down to, uh, to John the Baptist, who announces the coming of Christ to his ministry, the Messiah is about to, to present himself. 
And so we now find ourselves in the main body of Paul's message. Uh, up to this point, that's just like a, an introduction. Remember, he's preaching this in the he's preaching this in the synagogue, and they said, uh, anybody out there want to ex- give an exhortation? Yeah. Well, first, before you get the exhortation, you're going to get a history lesson. Verse 26 says, "Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent." Brethren, in this verse, that's brethren is those people that Paul is addressing in that synagogue. They're Jews. Paul's a Jew. Sons of Abraham's family, that's descendants of Abraham. Sons of Abraham's family, those descendants of Abraham. And those among you who fear God, that is a reference to Gentile proselytes. Don't talk about a a proselyte here in just a minute. Got that superscript one there. So Paul is addressing Jews in the synagogue and a reference to Gentile proselytes. He said to us, that is, he categorizes categorizes the persons being addressed. I should say categorizes the, the no, let me back up here. When he says to us, that is, us is the categories of persons being addressed. That's who this is, to us. And he said, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent. Let's take a look at this idea of proselytes. We had Jews in the synagogue and got Gentile proselytes. There was, there was a process through which a non-Jew could become a Jewish proselyte. So if you were a Gentile, you could actually become a Jew. But here's what you had to do. <clears throat> we call, you call them Jewish proselytes. And that process involved three things. If you are a Gentile and you want to become a Jew, you had to, first of all, you had, had to make a sacrifice And that sacrifice is either a heifer or a pair of turtle doves. Secondly, you had to be circumcised. And third, you had to be baptized. So what we see here then is brethren, verse 26, that son of Abraham, there's the descendants of Abraham and those Gentile proselytes who fear God. To us, these categories of people, the message of this salvation has been sent. Now, the next verse, 27, we're going to see Paul's addressing these people now. Just a moment. Paul is addressing these Jews and these Gentile proselytes. He says, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, what happened? Now, just sort of get a picture here. Paul is talking here about people who live in Jerusalem and the rulers. He's talking about irreligious Jews, and he's going somewhere with it. So I want you, I want you up here in Antioch, Pisidia. I want you, you, you are, you're Jews. The, the primary group in the synagogue today are Jews. How did you get here? You got here. You just didn't pack up one day and say, oh, you know, I think I'll go to Antioch, Pisidia. Uh, you know, I, I could have gone to Cyprus or Salamis or, or, you know, I could have gone to Perga, uh, Italia. I could have gone someplace else. No, nah, I, I think I'll just go to Antioch in Pisidia. No, they didn't just decide they were going to do that. Oh, they made a decision, all right. But they went there because of persecution. They had been driven out of land because of persecution. And for whatever reason, they ended up, some ended up in, in uh, Antioch, Pisidia. These are, these are people who are, in fact, Jews, whose heritage came out of, out of Jerusalem, out of that area, Judea, but driven out, and they're up there now. So he's saying, now look, you know, you know, because every, every Sabbath day you get up here and you sit down and you read Scripture, you're reading the Mosaic Law, you know something about the history of we Jews. So for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him, neither him or nor the utterances of the prophets, 
which are read every Sabbath, ho oh, oh, ho, fulfilled these by condemning him. Listen to this. Look at verse. Look at the, ex, uh, the exposition of this. For those who live in Jerusalem, that's religious, unbelieving Jews, and their rulers, what happened? He said, look, just look back there and see what happened. He said, these rulers and these people who lived there, they did not recognize Jesus. Didn't recognize him as the Messiah. Neither did they recognize the utterances of the prophets, which they read every Sabbath. So what happened is, when they're reading the scripture, they're reading what these, what these prophets were saying. Wait a minute. Every Sabbath they do this. But they failed to recognize Jesus that was being prophesied for 1,300 years. They failed to understand the prophets and what they were reading every Sunday and realized that actually the prophets had told them that the Messiah will come, and guess what? When he comes, guess what you're going to do? You're going to reject him. In fact, you're going to crucify him. You're going to execute him. You're going to kill him. Wow. Paul explains that the rulers and those who dwell in Jerusalem, he, listen, what did he say? He, they did not know who Jesus really was. They didn't know. There he is. But they didn't know who he was. Nor did they understand the message of the prophets which they read every Sabbath day, and yet they fulfilled. They fulfilled the prophet's prediction. The prophets predicted. They won't recognize him. They won't know who he is. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to, they're going to persecute him and kill him. Well, look here. What did Paul say about this in 1 Corinthians 2 8? For they had for had they known it, <laughs> had they known what the prophet said, had they known who this was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what happened, they were they were in they were in the synagogue every time the door was open when they were supposed to be there. They were reading scripture day in and day out, sort of like going to Sunday school class. And having somebody teach a Sunday school class that doesn't have a clue about what they're doing. Just open the Bible, read the, read the verse, and then ask 15 people in the class, what do you think that what do you think it says? What do you think it means? And find out that they did that they're reading the same kind of scripture in various versions of the Bible that tried to, that we read here about Saul, how old he was when he became king, and how long he was king. You saw that you saw those scriptures. How how the, the it, they weren't many of them weren't saying the same thing. How do you draw a conclusion if you don't have the right information? So Paul said, "Hey, you're, they, they're in synagogue, all right, but they're just going through the motions. They had no idea who Jesus was. And by the way, they they when they heard him, they said, this guy's a fake. Let's get rid of him.' And so they crucified him. In verse twenty-eight. Jesus is innocent, but executed anyway. It says, although they found, see these, although they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. Well, let's pull that apart a little bit. It says, and though they, who is they? These are the unbelieving religious Jew, Jewish rulers that were there at the time Christ was on planet Earth. And these are the people that actually were involved in his crucifixion. But hold just a moment. When they brought him before the rulers, guess what? They found no ground for putting him to death. No, they didn't find any ground. In other words, the thought that goes through my mind is collusion, the Russian collusion. And all the fake news and all of the lies they're being told. And we as, we as born-again Christians, we need the truth, folks. We need the truth that covers the, the whole counsel of God's word, word. And we need to understand the whole counsel of God's word with a, with a, with a, uh, a, wor a biblical worldview, meaning that there is no subject out here in life. No subject that God doesn't have an answer for in the Bible. 
But you can't know what that answer is if we don't know the Bible, don't know what it says. So here are these Jews, unbelieving religious Jews, the rulers, although they found no ground to put him to death. Well, the best we can do, he's innocent. But I'll tell you what. They asked Pilate. And who was Pilate? Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea from AD 26 to 36 AD. So they're going to they're, they're going to ask they're going to ask uh, the, the Roman the Roman governor of Judea at that point in time. They're going to ask, you know, what about this? Uh, what do we do, Pilate? But we want him executed. Well, why did they go to Pilate? These are the rulers of, of Israel, the Jewish rulers of Israel, and they go to a Roman governor. Why did they do that? Well, here's why. We actually mentioned this, taught this within the last couple of weeks. The reason the Jewish rulers, there it is, the reason the Jewish rulers went to Pilate was because Jewish rulers had no authority under the Roman, under Roman law. They had no authority to crucify Jesus without Pilate's consent. So they went to him and said, uh, excuse me, um, he's innocent, all right, but we want to get rid of him. So all Jesus was innocent, his crucifixion, what happened? His crucifixion fulfilled all that had been predicted concerning him in the writings of the prophets. 1,300 years worth. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Here's what he's going to be. Here's what he's going to look like. He's coming. He's coming. Yeah. But at the same time, we're telling you he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. But at the same time, we're going to tell you, when he gets there, you're not going to recognize him. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to kill him. Zechariah 12.10 says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. They, these rulers, these at that point in time, looking forward. They will look on me, Jesus. These rulers, these Jews, religious Jews, failing to see that I am the Messiah of Israel, the one come to establish the kingdom on earth. What are they going to do? They're going to look on me, whom they have pierced. An indication that they're going to kill him. Now watch this. While that's the passage, this comes out of the Old Testament. They will look on me, whom they have pierced. John, John 19.37 actually confirms it. Again, and again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 13.7 says, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. That's the Old Testament. Matthew 26 in the New Testament. Matthew 26.31. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Isaiah 55, 53, 8 says, He was cut down. He was cut off of the land of the living. Do you see this? Look here. Do you see this? These are Old Testament passages. Zechariah. Zechariah. Isaiah. These are just three among many. These are passages they should have understood, and hey, they may have even, they may have even, well, you, you read that, so oh yeah, don't read that to me, I know what that says. Yeah, he was cut off out of the land of the living. Their problem was, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, he was cut off out of the land of the living. They will, they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Hell yeah, Though, yeah, I, I memorized those when I was just a kid. The problem was they, uh, they, they knew the verse was there, but they did not understand what it meant. Then in verses 29 and 30, prophecy is completely fulfilled. This is the prophecy about Christ. The predictions that he's going to come, the predictions that he's going to kill him, going to crucify him. Verse 29 and 30 says, but one, now I've got, I've got four areas underlined here. It says when they had carried out 
all that was written concerning him. They took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb, but, but God raised him from the dead. Remember now, remember now, Paul is still talking to these religious unbelieving Jews in the synagogue in Antioch, Pisidia. And he says, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, what happened? He's talking about the fact that he came on the scene and going through all of this history. He finally gets here, starts out in his ministry, and what do you do? You reject him, you reject him, you reject him, you reject him, and finally you go to Pilate and say, look, we want rid of this guy. So they get permission, and what do they do? They crucify him. All that was written concerning him. And what was all that was written? Not just the good things, but the very fact that it was predicted that they would crucify him. Secondly, it says they took him down from the cross. Yeah. And what happened? And they laid him in a tomb. But, oh, God, in spite of all that, but all this, you got to get, you got to see this, folks. You got to see it. All these verses from 22 all the way down here, what we've done here, finally you get to the fact where they crucify him, they bury him, and, and what happens? Three days later, they say, well, you know, they crucify him, they take him down on the cross, they put him in a tomb, and say, well, phew, whoa. boy, I'm glad that's all, that's, I'm glad that's done. That is over, period over now, done, never have to do that again. But what they didn't realize was three days later, they crucified the Messiah. This guy, is, he is coming out of the grave. God raised him from the dead. You see, the Old Testament prophets wrote many things about Christ's rejection. See, I, I just gave you some up here. These are just a few. The Old Testament prophets wrote many things about Christ's rejection. And after Christ was crucified, he was taken down from the cross, and his body was laid in a sepulcher, was laid in a grave, and then I've got this great big emboldened conjunction of contrast in spite of all that. God raised Jesus from the dead. See, even though the unbelieving Jews did everything they could to eliminate the Messiah from the scene, God the Father had a plan. Yes, he did. And God's plan goes on in spite of mankind's negative illusion. Jesus was seen in his resurrection. Verse 31. For many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. In verse 31, the exposition. And for many days, 40 days after, he was, after his resurrection, for many days, Jesus appeared to those apostles and others who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. The very, the very ones, the apostles and others, who are now his witnesses to the people, to the people, to the Jews first. You see, the fact of Christ's resurrection, his resurrection was attested. Not on the basis of rumor. Oh no, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure, but I, I hear somebody told me that Jesus came out of the grave. He's resurrected. No, it wasn't rumor. It wasn't even two or two witnesses. But there were many witnesses who saw Jesus in his resurrection body. And in 1 Corinthians 15:6, Paul says, after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But a few have fallen asleep. A few died physically. There are eleven occasions in the Bible where Jesus, uh, in the Bible, where Jesus Christ was seen. Acts one tells us that Christ lived on earth for forty days after his resurrection. Now, in verse thirty-two, Paul and Barnabas preached the good news. He says, "And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers." That's Paul and Barnabas preaching. And they were preaching again. Make sure you realize they're still in the synagogue. And what are they doing? They're preaching the good news. What is it? Jesus is the promised Messiah. That is the good news. And he's the, it's the good news of the promise. What? Made to the fathers. 
That promise is now fulfilled. He is here. He had his three years of ministry. You, you crucified him. He died. He died. You buried him. But A, hold on now. He came out of the grave. He's resurrected. So God fulfills his promise. In that, the next verse, God fulfills his promise. And I ask, why should we doubt it? Verse, in verses 33 and 34, Paul establishes that the resurrection of the Messiah was predicted in the Old Testament by quoting from Psalm 2-7 and Psalm Isaiah 55-3. Now, it's, we're, time is up right here. So let me take a look here. We're in verse 33, getting ready to go into verse 44. Um, we've got just a little bit more. So I'll tell you what. We'll pick up, we'll pick up with verse 33 then on uh, this coming Sunday. And those of you who already have the notes, keep them there. I'll rework the notes. I will, um, I'll give some, um, some introduction. We'll take this, and as a result of this class, there may be things that I think of that I need to put in the, the notes as we move on from verse 33 to, uh, to, actually, it's 33 to 52. And then we go into chapter 14. So let me thank all of you who are online with me right now. And um, I thank you for being here. And I will be, uh, by the way, uh, let me just say this. You see Chaplain Steve Haynes on, online with me? I forgot to, uh, to mention that. I was thinking about Daryl and I forgot to mention uh, Chaplain Steve. Chaplain Steve was not well, not feeling well today. And uh, as a result, he felt it best to stay home. So he stayed home and stayed online with me. So listen, God bless all of you. I'm going to go ahead and close out my recording for um, for. Um,